the, it's really hard to parse uh, based because of the, the, this, this uh, radio silence on the part of the Ukrainians uh, to parse what is fact from fiction when you look at what's being reported by these Russian military bloggers. What is the sense in your view as to where the heavy fighting is happening? Uh, I think the evidence is now pointing that there is quite heavy fighting in the sort of Zaporizhia uh, region uh, to the south of or Orihiv uh, in an attempt to sort of pierce the defenses there on the way to Tokmak. And and here the, the fighting is, has been very intense in over the last uh, couple of days because uh, the defensive lines of the Russians are, are very, very strong. There are many lines of defense. The Russians uh, have been building this offensive for quite some time. Uh, they, they sort of know the terrain. Uh, the armed forces here, the sort of the 58th combined arms army is, is, is more professional uh, than, than other forces of Russia. So I think this is an area where we are seeing quite intensive fighting and uh, where there is loss of equipment, which is is, is something that we should, should expect. I think that to imagine that, you know, these sort of campaigns can take place uh, without um, damage uh, to equipment and losses is, is not, is not uh, realistic. Yeah, th this area between the, the, those towns south of Zaporizhia on the Russian side uh, 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 of the Dnipro River, um, how far towards the Azov Sea have Ukrainian forces reached? Uh, they haven't. They haven't reached very far. I mean, this is not the kind of piercing and breakthrough that many, you know, many were maybe uh, sort of expecting uh, in terms of those who are not very familiar with the way these operations are carried out. I don't think we were expecting this sort of major breakthrough because uh, the opposing side is, is uh, you know, has had uh, quite some time to reinforce itself. So I think that it's at the moment it's very difficult to know how far the Ukrainians have have reached. Uh, because the uh, information that we are receiving is is um, is changing all the time, and Ukrainians might be advancing, but then they might be a counteroffensive by the Russians, where the Ukrainians are then potentially pushed back. So I think it's very early to say, and I think that the advances along the front line are going to occur in this form. They're going to be slow. They're going to be, um, you know, taking just uh, maybe some meters, maybe kilometers. For example, in the area around Bakhmut, uh, there is talk about having advanced 200, uh, 200 meters to two to kilometers. So, uh, you know, I think this is a kind of advance that, that unfortunately we are going to get used to uh, unless we see sort of a major collapse of the front, but certainly not in this region. And what is important to remember is that the sort of the, the breaking of the dam in, in Novokhakovkaya really reduced a significant part of the front for the Russians. So now the areas that they have to defend are they're, they're relatively uh, uh, vast, but they're smaller than, than they could have been if there had been a uh, possibility for the Ukrainians also to advance uh, over the Dnipro River. Well, there's two, so schools of, there's two schools of thought, right, on this. On the one hand, like you say, it reduces the amount of territory to defend for the Russians. On the other, uh, once those floodwaters recede in seven to ten days' time, Domitia, uh, the idea that it'll be easier because the water will be shallower for the Ukrainians to cross. Yes, but I think that, uh, you know, the situation around these areas is very complex. There are many villages that, uh, you know, that are underwater. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not in a position to argue that this is not going to be a, an area of advance. I've read reports that this is a possibility, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very cautious as to whether Ukrainians are going to be able to push through these areas. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, we, we need to bear in mind that this here, the terrain is quite open. Uh, it's, it's difficult to find areas of protection. So it's really among the most challenging areas for the Ukrainians to advance. Uh, so I think that we, we need to see and, and wait and see, you know, how the, how the situation develops around the areas that are now, uh, you know, used to be underwater and then they're going to be uh, sort of uh, dry. Uh, I wonder if that is going to be a, a potential uh, avenue of advance. Domitia Sagomoso, have you been able to verify uh, these images we've seen from, from Russian social media of uh, the Ukrainians employing German leopard tanks in combat? 
I think there is some evidence that, uh, you know, that leopard tanks have been involved and some of these, uh, you know, tanks have been damaged or destroyed. And this is com completely, uh, you know, uh, expected in, in a war scenario. I think we, we're getting used to, uh, you know, we got used to this perception that, you know, uh, for example, in the Gulf War and in the Iraqi War, the Americans advanced, uh, you know, and the perception was that they advanced very fast and they didn't lose a high number of equipment. But this is... It's really not uh, the kind of warfare that we are going to witness. This is much more similar to the kind of operations of the Second World War, where there is a lot of damaged equipment. So that is why it's so important. And I was emphasizing this from the very beginning, to have sort of this industrial military production in place so that we do not worry too much if there is a loss of some particular equipment, but there is a production line that comes in constantly. There's sort of this a, you know, conveyor belt or provision of military equipment, which is, I think, also what the Russians understood and they're doing. And we really need to match that if we want the Ukrainians to succeed. Because that's we definitely not it. happening on the Ukrainian side? It is happening very slowly. Uh, Europeans only very recently are sort of re, re sort of starting their military industrial machine, as we know. I mean, it took some time even to agree to deliver military uh, tanks. Uh, to uh, Ukraine. And it's only in the last months that there is a, a, a decision now to sort of re-start re, um, the, the military industrial production. And I think that is really where we need to uh, put our attention as well. You know, how much are we ready to then pro keep providing and not sort of drop the Ukrainians because the first uh, sort of attempts at, at, at chasing the defenses of the Russians are not very successful. I think that would be very disappointing. That is why I think that we really need to bear in mind and to, to enter this uh, sort of way of thinking that this is going to be long and that we need to ha be ready to uh, to provide, you know, in, uh, military support, you know, in the longer term uh, to make sure that Ukrainians are not left you know, sort of hanging because it's very courageous and very challenging what they're trying to do. Uh, so here, the industrial dimension of the military production, I think it's very, very relevant. I mean, there are these reports this Friday that uh, Russia is going to start producing on its own soil those Iranian-made uh, drones. Uh, and that brings us to one final question, an important one, uh, which is how far can the Ukrainians advance without air supremacy? Well, that is a really important question. And, uh, you know, there has been uh, reports that, the, you know, that the Ukrainians, uh, you know, that the West was sort of uh, relying on other sort of um, missiles, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, ground to air missiles or air to air missiles to, to sort of cover up for that. But that is very challenging. And I think that slowly we're going to start understanding that proper air cover and proper air support is necessary if you carry out these kinds of operations. Also, because you want to neutralize the opponent's uh, air cap capabilities, which apparently Russia now is using quite effectively. So. Uh, I think that the air component is going to become increasingly relevant. Domitia Sagromoso, Senior Lecturer in Conflict Security and uh, 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 at the, the Department of War Studies at King's College London. Thank you for speaking with us here on France 24. Thank you.